ready for the three skills? Okay, okay. <clears throat> First is what we call emotional regulation. And, uh, and I want, let me just anchor these three skills again. I'm going to teach you three skills so that you can achieve your com the company reputation and the company culture you need. And by the way, it's not just for attracting A players. The kind of culture we want you to get into place is not only, uh, you know, you will get, you will attract the best players and you'll get the best results. I mean, it's kind of, it's all the same. We need, we need the same parts to be successful. So when I talked about that first key being self-leadership, the biggest, biggest thing about self-leadership is can you, can your people, can you and your team members, um, uh, stay out of emotional reactivity and when you're in emotional reactivity get yourself out of it so that it's not running your behavior and to do that we need something called emotional regulation so let me back up for just a second I think of emotional reactivity as, first of all, something that is entirely human. Okay, it's like there are, you know, um, unless you're a psychopath, you're, you have incredibly strong emotions. Everybody does. And they are emotions developed in a, you know, long before evolutionarily, uh, it, our emotions developed long, long, long ago, well before our frontal lobe that has all of the, the amazing, complex, critical, um, innovative thinking. I mean, the things where we can interact in a society and, you know, build my God, a, a global world full of technology and put people on the moon and all of that. That's from here. Okay. But our frontal lobe is new and weak. It's super limited. It's lazy. It, um, it only has, you know, so much uh, um, it wants to do. <laughs> And it is not designed to protect us. Our amygdala and our emotional centers sit kind of near our amygdala. Those are meant to protect us. So, uh, and not only protect us, but also, um, what you call it, procreate, right? This, this emotional reactivity is ultimately about survival. The thing is, we live in a world now where survival isn't a daily issue for us. It used to be. And since survival isn't a daily issue for us, we kind of, it would have been good if we could have turned off part of this. Because it's inconvenient. It runs automatically. It, um, it senses things before we think about it. It literally just brings in information from the outside world, it makes its own interpretations without you knowing at all. And then it makes you uh, behave in a certain way that it deems good for the situation to protect you. Like blaming somebody. <laughs> like maybe having a difficult situation come up and getting defensive. Uh, some of my personal favorites, something challenging comes up and I want to avoid it. Sometimes I will even hide from it. And all of these actions are actually not thought out actions on my part. They're reactions. They're what I do when 
I don't get my emotions regulated so that I can put myself back here and make a better choice. These just happen. They don't take any thinking or energy. And so it is a major skill in for human beings in life and especially in business because in business, like we need people thinking that's kind of the whole point. Maybe there's a couple jobs out there where you could, you know, you could stay down here and still use your hands. I suppose. I don't know. Less and less of those. The robots take over those. So what we need now is people's thinking. So when people are in emotional reactivity, we get no thinking. The thinking we get is not good. Right? It's like, you know, think about how good um, other people's decision making is when they're not in a good place. It's not good. Yours isn't either. Our perceptions are skewed down here. We, we, we don't, um, we, we literally are being run by a system that is, is our, much more about our central nervous system, the automatic system. It's not about our intentional system where we choose. Make sense? Okay. This is super important because if we, in A players, for somebody to be an A player, for anybody to be effective in their role, they're going to need a level of emotional regulation ability to be productive, to actually have the staying power to think through a problem, to make a good decision, to interact with others who are also human. Make sense? Okay, so then what do you do when you get into emotional reactivity? Because we all go here. In fact, one of the ones that my team and I have noticed lately that's just, you know, pervasive, it's an epidemic for um, uh, entrepreneurs is overwhelm. Overwhelm, that feeling of there's always too much to do. It's an, you know, it's an anxious feeling. It's not, it's a, it's a, um, when people are experiencing overwhelm, we tend to want to do some of these other behaviors. We don't, we rarely do the things that would actually fix it. Because it's hard. It's hard to face overwhelm. Our more primitive self would rather kick in something else. Hope it goes away, I guess. Make sense? Okay. So, so to get out of emotional reactivity, we're going to need two things. Um, the biggest thing we're going to need is self-awareness. Self-awareness. Literally, the awareness of, oh my God, I'm down here. Like, I was totally defensive on that call. That means that I am triggered and emotionally reactive. That means that when I was interacting with this person, it was not trying to solve a problem. I was trying to make sure that I was perceived well, that I, I was not getting blamed, that my status was still strong, right? Or that nobody was going to overpower me, whatever it was. It was about me. And very much about the emotional um, protection of me, not about the outcome that we're going for. Can you see it? So we first have to recognize that I'm down here, got to recognize it, and then I'm going to have to make the choice to self-regulate. Okay. Let's talk about what you can do to regulate. But I want you to know that it's the choice that's hard. It's the choice. It's like, I, I really do have to acknowledge I'm in emotional reactivity and I really do have to do one of these other behaviors to get out of it. 
So since this is from your nervous system, your central nervous system, your automatic system, it's not your thinking brain, even though it might seem like it. Um, what we need to do is something that's going to calm down that central nervous system. So that's things like taking deep breaths, getting up from your chair and walking around the block, um, uh, um, doing a little bit of meditating. Um, some people are use tapping. It's another way. It's almost always going to be a change of state. Because we have to stop your central nervous system from, um, from running the energy through your brain. Does that make sense to everybody? And we need to learn these ways. Um, Freeform writing, journaling, that can be a really good way. Um, anybody else have any suggestions for how they self-regulate? What do you do? What do you do when your system is running and you're like, oh my gosh, I need to get a hold of that. What do you do? Walk to the coffee shop. Awesome. Yes. Coffee, you know, getting coffee is an awesome <laughs> way to regulate. I love coffee, uh, obviously. So yeah, awesome. Uh, jump up and down, perfect. Jump up and down and shake. That is awesome, totally. Yep, uh, yep. Even in my office, totally, I love that. Hey, Lisa, by the way. <laughs> That's awesome, you guys. Okay, makes sense? Okay, let me keep moving. Uh, okay, so, so this is, this might seem like a small thing, but I want you to know that this is a big, big, big skill. Like being able to catch yourself in emotional reactivity and get yourself emotionally regulated. And when I say emotionally regulated, I don't mean that all those emotions go away, but they, they um, decrease to a level that you can use your brain and make different choices. So what that looks like is, Maybe in a conversation where I was defensive, after I jump up and down and shake and, you know, get myself back to a place where my emotions are regulated enough, they're down enough, and I still have a little bit of anxiety, but it's not making me defensive, I can go back into that conversation and engage in a way that's not defensive. Engage in a way that actually is going to stay focused on the outcome of like, what are we really going for here? Let's talk about that. So it's not running my behavior. Can you see the difference? Okay, great. That's skill number one. Skill number two. <clears throat> this one is um, one of those things that I wish they would teach in school. School. Actually, I wish they would teach all of this in school. But this is kind of like, uh, you know, I've met, I've met so many people with MBAs um, that don't know how to set an expectation. I can't imagine how it's like these things are taken for granted. And they need to be learned in a way that becomes a habit for everybody here. So, so Setting clear expectations is one of those things that is fundamental to success. You can't get what you're going for unless you know the outcome. I know this is simple, <laughs> but you can't imagine how many businesses struggle that when I ask the team, you know, do you guys know exactly what you're going for? They say, not really. It's changed so many times. I actually, now I, I, I don't have any idea what we're going for. It's like, how are they going to be productive in that? So, so to set, so um, how would I say? It's also a, um, you know, it's the number one rule for setting people up for success. Let's let them know what a win looks like. <laughs> What does it look like if you're successful, if you win? 
So there's five steps in it. You don't have to do them in order. You don't have to use perfect language, but we gotta hit these points. And the first is, what's the outcome? What does the intended outcome look like? This is the, this is the what. <laughs> What are the details? What's the timeline? What, um, uh, you know, what does it look like, sound like, smell like? <laughs> what format is it in? <laughs> right, so this is all about uh, letting a person know what success looks like. The second is purpose and benefits. Because the purpose, is the real thing they're going for. This is the why. If we get this outcome, this is um, what um, we're gonna really get from it. Make sense? Um, I have a, a, a great story if, uh, from a client who did an event with um, 4,000 people and he was, wanted to have a reveal at the end of this live workshop with 4,000 people. A reveal where people got a special gift that was taped under their chair. Okay, so he said to his people, go tape this little, you know, this little worksheet or this table thing, go just tape it under all the chairs. Okay, he was actually delegating a task. They didn't know why they were taping it under the chairs. So then when he came out onto stage, he looked into the audience and you could see all of the, um, the prizes under their chairs. You could see them. So that means that, you know, thousands of people were gonna walk in and just start pulling those things off their seats because they could see them, it's right there, right? So they didn't know um, that the purpose, you know, first of all, they didn't know a good outcome looks like our people can't see them, the participants can't see, and we're doing it so we could have a surprise at the end of the day. If they knew we're gonna have a surprise at the end of the day, they probably even would have figured out this part. Okay, so the next thing is the how, and how we'll achieve this is, I think of this as, um, the roles, the resources we're going to use, right? Who's doing what? Um, maybe how we'll coordinate. Um, maybe, uh, you know, who we need to include and ask, whatnot. Then the fourth part, super important really want this to become a habit for people. And it is um, how we're gonna surface challenges. So this is the what if. What if things don't go according to plan? What if a challenge comes forward and we don't know how to move past it? What will we do if that happens? Are we gonna, are you gonna call me? Are we gonna call each other? Are we gonna raise it in the Monday morning meeting? Are we going to slack it to each other? It's like, how are we gonna know there's a challenge to solve? And then the last part is knowing that even when you're setting outcomes and expectations, it's two way. And Two-way commitments are also known as agreement. Even though we're kind of unilaterally setting it, we actually still really need a confirmation that the other person is committing. Because if we don't get this confirmation, um, we won't know that they're, you know, that they've, said um, that they haven't said anything and they're really thinking, well, maybe I'll do that. 
Make sense? We want to make sure that we're both on the same page. And that helps us also talk about anything that might get in the way of getting it done. Okay, good. This is skill number two. Again, I know it seems kind of simple, but we want you to know this, this kind of script or these components so well that anytime you're making a new agreement or delegating something or um, putting in place a new project, whatever it is, that you use all these steps. Really important. If you don't, what happens is you have to connect with your team over this 20 times instead of once. Make sense? Because, you know, and you'll be connecting in problems, like basic problems, instead of, you know, the real challenges that were unexpected. Okay, so get this one down. Okay, last skill. It's kind of a mindset skill. And um, we call this um, A to B. It is the kind of the mindset, the mind model you need to be able to always have continuous learning and results. Whoops. Continuous learning and results. Okay, okay. So, first thing we gotta know is, a is the current state. Okay. Where we are right now. And B is where we want to go, obviously. Okay. But what I want you to know about B is it's two things. It's your big goals, you know, and purpose, big goals and purpose. It's like, what do we want to achieve? What does it really look like? If we achieve it, what impact will we have made for our, you know, customers, community, planet, whatnot? Okay, so our goals and our purpose, and it's also our level of operating excellence. Level of operating excellence. I want you to um, think for a moment about um, when to get your big goals, um, how much you have to get better and better at everything you do, right? To achieve the big impact on the world, you need to, um, and to get maybe the size of business you want, etc. you're going to need to um, keep improving your quality. You're going to need to Get things faster to market. You're going to need to um, uh, um, um, connect better with your customer. You're going to need to stay ahead on technology. There's just not anything that you that you as a team is not going to have to get better and better at doing, at making happen. Okay, so these go together, and we point this out because. To get the goals, you have to get better and better at what you do. Kind of like a sports team going from, you know, amateur to pro. Okay. So, one of the things about A to B is that uh, everybody wants a straight line. <laughs> right? <clears throat> if I had the straight line, <clears throat> I would just teach that or sell that okay the thing is is that this straight line does not exist it's not available it's not going to happen do not choose business if you want a straight line to results choose something else i'm not sure what but not business because what business looks like is like this right? It's like, you know, you plan, you take a step, and then things happen. 
There is so much about business that does not go according to plan. And so really what we're looking for is that every time we take a step and it doesn't bring us enough towards B, that this is the, this is the learning moment, right? This is where we pause, we reflect on what's just happened, and we're like, you know, hey, need to adjust, need to replan, need to put on different resources on it maybe, whatnot, and then we're gonna take a new step. Now that one may not work either. It's okay, because we're gonna get new learning again. And by the way, these learnings are incredibly valuable. These are learnings that um, are so much more powerful than reading something from a book. They're crazy powerful. And when we work with them well, then we start to get better and better at each next step we take until we get to be. But the expectation here cannot be that this, that going in the wrong direction, messing up is bad and wrong. Because what will happen if we decide that messing up is bad and wrong, uh, anybody know what happens? If you can't mess up, what do people do? They do nothing. <laughs> yeah, A, you don't learn. And if people are afraid that they're going to get blasted for making mistakes, for messing up, yeah, somebody else said they lie. They totally lie. They cover up. Absolutely. And whenever possible, they actually don't even move. They're like, I'm just not going to do anything because that looks like way too risky. Yeah, uh, somebody said that they quit. Yes, they often do. Yep, so, so anyhow, so um, we need your environment to be all about, let's take the best step we can take, and then we are going to learn. Like, this is the leadership learning part, how we handle messing up, not going in the right direction, having it go badly, that's the skill how we deal with that. Because the better we deal with it, the faster we'll take this step. Then the better we'll learn from this step. And then we're gonna take, you know, a step that's really good, really close to the line. And another one that's really close to the line. Maybe the next one, not quite, but, but over time, these get better and better. And I think of it very much like a, um, kind of in the same vein as a sports team. Right, so um, in the early days, if you are, um, I had a stepson that played basketball, and when he was a little kid, not much was expected of him when he was at A. He could just show up to practice, and as long as he ran in the right direction, that's all that was needed. And then as he went to the next step of um, learning basketball, he suddenly had to learn positions. Like, you know, they couldn't, they couldn't be like a beehive around the ball anymore. So they had to learn positions, more is expected of him. Had to learn how to pass the ball, can't just hog it. Um, then as he was, you know, had to practice more. Then as he was going and playing in high school, the level of expectations went up again. Like not only did he have to be, you know, good at his position and, um, uh, um, my gosh, you know, be a good athlete. He had to be in really great shape. He had to show up to practices every day. He had to practice in the summer. You know, he had to make sacrifices, no partying at night during the week, all of that, right? Because more was expected of him. But he was getting better and better at basketball. There was a time though, in his, uh, at the beginning of his senior year that he decided that Basketball wasn't for him anymore. He didn't want, he couldn't, um, he didn't want to keep going with the team because 
it, um, uh, it required kind of too much of him, right? Too much time, too much dedication, too much of his focus. And he decided, I'm not going to become a professional basketball player, so I'm going to work on something else. I'm going to, you know, take that energy and pump it into my grades so I get into a better college. It's a choice he made. Okay. So, uh, but if he had gone on to college, you know, he'd have to be even better again. And by the time you're pro, it's practically like, um, my gosh, is your, your body is almost not even yours. <laughs> it's... it's Kind of like, you know, they're going to put you on a sleep schedule and a vitamin schedule and a eating schedule and a practice all the time, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So the thing about that is that as you get better and better, your, the level of, um, your range of acceptable behavior narrows. So what that means is when you're a little kid playing basketball, it's okay to not pass the ball. <laughs> At some point when you're on your journey, you got to pass the ball. It's no longer okay to not pass the ball. And this is going to happen in your business all the time where what was okay on A is not okay anymore. But in business, we tend to think, well, what I signed up for was just what I signed up for. Like, I, that was my deal. Like, if it was okay, if I was late every day, I expect that to stay in place forever. And what we need to know about business is like, we can't. We have to keep learning and getting better. We, we have to, we won't be successful if we don't have everybody grow in their abilities and their performance and in their ability to operate in the way we need them to operate. Does that make sense to everybody? So it's like, you know, you may have somebody who's operating at this level. It's fine. Let's say for, um, I'll just use a simple one, like coming late to work, okay? Like early on, it's fine. Nobody's impacted by this person coming late to work. Then we start having meetings first thing on Monday morning, and this person's not there, but it's still not all that big a deal. But suddenly, this Monday morning meeting is critical for how the entire week is going to go. And now this person coming late is unacceptable. Even though when we started out, she's like, I always come late. Like, that's, that's my deal here. Nobody cares. I stay late. Why would you care if I come late? It's like, no, no, we care now because it impacts everybody. Make sense? Okay. So this continuous learning, it's, I want you to think of it as not only continuous learning, but it's like you need to see it in your whole team becoming better and better at what they do. Like a sports team. They keep moving up in levels. Make sense? Okay, so let me give the, uh, maybe the last piece or the last thing that I just want you to know. I probably should have said at the beginning, but that's okay. Um, the thing about A, when people step off A and they run into this, most of the time, what do people want to do? You step off A, you run into a mess, then what are people often thinking? They're thinking, uh, yeah, they can give up for sure, and yep, they can hide, and a lot of people are thinking, Let's go back to A. You know what? A wasn't so bad. Actually, in hindsight, we kind of liked A. Where we see this a lot is with entrepreneurs who, um, you know, they get out here and then they're like, you know what? It's hard now. It's complex. I got a lot of people. This, these problems are harder to solve. It was nicer and easier when it was just me and my assistant. 
I liked it better back then. I've just I decided right now I would like it better back then. I would like to go back there. But this A is no longer there. Once you step off A, it's gone because you're different, right? You know different things now. Um, uh, and the world has changed. <laughs> Your business has changed. I mean, if you were going to go back to A, think of like um, how much maybe your products or services have improved over time. To go back to A, you have to like unwind that. Like go back to your very first product you ever made, right? It's like you want to put that one back out there? <laughs> Makes sense? So once you step off A, there is no A. 